for these graphs. Since there's no parent function, we're not gonna say like x squared, you know how x squared was the parent function for quadratic and x cubed was a parent function for cubic. There's no like quote unquote parent function for this. So we just have a general form. The general form of a growth or decay formula is y equal to a times b raised to the x power. Now the x is in the exponent, which is why this is called an exponential. So x in the exponent means exponential. It's a lot of words. In this equation, the a value is going to represent your initial amount. So for Ronnie, in the story that we read, the initial amount of rice she started with was 1. So that's what she started with on day 0. That's what she was given. Or on, yeah. The B value here that's in parentheses is going to be called your rate of growth or rate of decay. So in this general form, we have two numbers we're going to be plugging in every time. Our initial value, or the one grain of rice, and then the rate, or the fact that it was doubled. So those are the sort of things that you're looking for in this problem. The initial value and the rate, doubled, tripled, halved, those sorts of things. Or we can get more detailed and we can actually write what are called growth functions. Now, there's a lot of things happening right here. I want you right now to take a highlighter. I don't really care what color. And I want you to highlight the actual equation here because it's like tucked in with all of these arrows and such. The equation is y equal to a times one plus r raised to the t. This is exactly the same as the general form, except that instead of just having a's and b's, what do we have in the b spot? 1 plus r. So let's talk about what each of these things is. So obviously the 1 plus r, the stuff in the parentheses, is still going to be my growth factor. This is how we say um, that it is doubling or tripling or getting bigger in some way. That's going to tell us that. But this equation allows me to get more detailed. That r that is in the parentheses is called the percent increase or the rate. The one thing that's tricky about this is that when you plug this number into the equation, you have to use a decimal. And I'm making a big deal about that because the problems will give you a question or a number that's a percent. So we will have to be changing percents to decimals, which we will practice, don't worry. But this is an exponential growth function. It's going to model things that grow like Ronnie's grain of rice. So she started with one and doubled it every day, a 100% increase. And so it got bigger, bigger, bigger. But things don't always grow. Sometimes things decay. I want you to take that same highlighter and I want you to highlight this equation because again, it's just kind of tucked in here with all of these arrows. What's the only difference between the growth equation and the decay equation? It has a minus sign. That's the only difference here, which means pretty much everything is the same. You still have your initial amount. You still have your B value. But instead of being called a growth factor, we just changed the name to a decay factor. Because it's decaying or getting smaller. And instead of being called percent increase, this R or rate is called percent decrease. And again, it just needs to be in decimal form because it will give you numbers in percent form in the problem. When you plug the number in, you have to change it to a decimal. Now, some examples of things that decay, not to be morbid, but um, like forensic scientists, when they, stumble, when they are looking at like a, a corpse, they can measure how long it's been dead. They're looking at a decay factor. They're using this sort of equation to figure out how long it's been since this person has passed away. Other things that decay include like food. If you leave food out, it starts to get really gross, right? This is because of a decay factor, and we can measure how quickly things decay. Additionally, uh, you ever heard of like carbon dating? Do y'all know what that is? So when you find really, really old stuff, scientists can measure it and be like, this is from 8,000 BC. And you're like, how do you know that? It's from something called carbon dating, which uses this sort of stuff. So these do have applications in the real world. Not that you'll find an old fossil and figure out what how long how old it is, but it's cool to understand these things 
So when you read a news story, you're not just like, wow, that's cool. You actually can verify that that makes sense in your head. Now, before we really go on here, we are just going to practice changing things from decimals to percents because I think it's really important. And before we open this up and go on the inside, we need to practice that. Okay, thank you for reviewing that. Let's go on to the inside. Now, we got to talk about the shapes of these functions, which, again, should look pretty familiar for you because we did talk about this in Algebra 1. It's just been a minute. Um, before we do anything, I would love for you to draw in your X and Y axis because they're not printed on this. So on the second to last, like... Oh, my favorite calculator. My se The second to last, like, box, I want you to draw your X axis. And then basically in the center, I want you to, like, emphasize in your Y axis. I think that would be helpful if we know what we're looking at here. Let's do that on both graphs. We have our X axis, second to last row, and then middle-ish as good as possible, give me the y-axis <clears throat> for both growth and decay. Okay, so again, there are no like technical parent functions for this, but there are some typical functions, shapes for each of these. For the exponential growth function, we're going to use the equation y equal to 1 times 2 raised to the x power. Okay, 1 times 2 to the x power. Now, this is going to model exactly like Ronnie's grain of rice. How much are we going to start with? What's my initial value? One. one. She had one grain of rice at the beginning of the book. So that's why the one is there. That is also going to tell us a bunch of things. It is going to tell us, since it's my initial value, my y-intercept is 1. So the graph crosses the y-axis here at 1. Those are the two things I learn from the number one. The number two is going to tell me where to draw my next point. The number two tells me to double that number. What is double of one? Two. Okay. So my next coordinate point should be at two. What is double of two? Four. So my next coordinate point should be at four. Once you have three dots, it's pretty good to be able to draw a curve. Now, there's a couple things we need to talk about before we go ahead and draw this curve. Number one is that these graphs have horizontal asymptotes. We studied asymptotes in the last unit, and those were the lines that the graph's going to get close to but never touch. For every exponential function that we talk about, at least today, the horizontal asymptote is the same line, and it's going to be the line y equal to 0. So I'm going to draw in a dashed line. Maybe you can highlight it in since it needs to be on top of my x-axis. This asymptote right there is a boundary for this graph. We cannot ever reach 0 when we're doing the kind of functions we're doing today. Now we will transform these graphs so there's potential that that is different, but for today at least the answer to the asymptote is always going to be 0. Once we have that, we have enough information to draw my curve. We cannot touch the purple boundary, but we have to connect all the dots. So if I connect all the dots this way, it's pretty obvious that it's going up and off screen. Phew. But when I go the opposite way, I have to just come very, very close to that purple line, but never touch it. It's a boundary that we're going to get insanely close to, but we're never going to touch. That's an asymptote. For this attempt at a parent function for growth, the domain is going to be all real numbers, which is going to be the same answer for all of these exponentials. It's never going to change. But the range is either only above the asymptote or only below the asymptote. And today, it's always going to be above because we're going to be dealing with real life stuff. So my range is all y values greater than 0, specifically greater than. Don't put the equal to sign on there because we will never actually be equal to zero. That's where that purple asymptote is. So a lot of these answers, specifically these, are going to be the same, especially today for the kind of functions we're working with because we're not transforming them. We're just changing their shape a little bit. That's what an exponential growth function looks like. Does this look familiar from when you studied Algebra 1 stuff? 
Yeah, I saw a couple heads nod. Great, let's look at decay. Again, there are no parent functions necessarily for this uh, in this class. So we're going to use the equation y equal to 1 times 1 half raised to the x power. What's the difference between the number I used in the growth parentheses and this decay parentheses? It's 0 0.5. It's 0 0.5. So the decay has to be a number less than 1 because we subtracted in the decay equation and we added in the growth equation. So decays will always have fractions or decimals that are less than 1 in this parentheses. Okay, cool. So for this parent function, so we can just get the shape, what is the y-intercept? 1. So we have a y-intercept at 0, 1 the same way, and here's my 1. The number in the parentheses tells you what to do with that initial value. It says take half of it. What is half of 1? Don't overthink it. What is 1 half times 1? One half. Okay, do your best. I want you to draw a half in there. What is half of a half? A quarter. So we're going to get even smaller in there. I've got three points, which feels pretty good. I need to draw my line. But I need to draw in my boundary first. There is still a boundary line, an asymptote here at the x-axis that we are not allowed to cross. And I'm sure you're thinking, but Miss Quigley, we're getting so close. You're right. It's going to get really, really close to it, but it's not going to touch it. You could zoom in on your computer until the world ended, and you would not find that that graph crosses the x-axis. So when we draw this in, we connect our dots, and we don't cross the x-axis one direction. And when we go the opposite direction, we just follow the pattern. Do you see the difference in what these shapes look like? For growth and decay. It's pretty obvious which one's growth and which one's decay, correct? One of them's going up, one of them's going down. Don't overthink that. For this graph, the asymptote is still y equal to zero. Like I said, that's going to be the same answer for the entire day today until we transform these graphs. And the domain is still all real numbers and the range is still everything above zero because we're still above the asymptote. So that's also going to be the same answer today. Until we start transforming these graphs, it'll pretty much be the same answer the whole time. So the shapes are what the shapes are. It's great. We can read a graph. You can find inputs and outputs. But these actually have really interesting or relevant um, equations and functions in real life. So we're going to look at some equations. Okay, so in this problem, here's the sort of things that we do. We need to identify the function as growth or decay. We'll do that first. Look at this first equation. The way we decide if functions are growth or decay is we look at the b value, which is the number in the parentheses. Is that number bigger than 1 or less than 1? Less than 1. Less than 1. So what I have had to add or subtract in the equation Subtract, which means it's a decay equation. Awesome. It then says to uh, tell the initial value, the rate of growth or decay, R as a percent, and then evaluate. We'll worry about evaluating later. Let's fill out A and B. We just look at the equation for A and B. A is 475. So the first number in each of these equations, so not in parentheses, is your initial value, your A value. Your B value is the number in the parentheses. Don't overthink that. You just rewrite down the numbers. However, this question asks for the rate. Remember, the rate of decay came from that equation, and it was 1 minus R. That's going to be the number in parentheses. For growth, it was plus. So what we have to think to ourselves, and this is us doing some algebra in our head, if you know this parentheses should say 1, but you subtracted a number from it to make it 0 0.5, what number did you subtract from 1 to make it 0 0.5? 0 0.5. So my rate is also 0 0.5, but we want to write that as a percent. What percentage is 0.5? 50%. So my rate of decay is 50%. I know it's 50% because, again, 
this parentheses should be 1, but it says 0.5. So I had to subtract something from it. Specifically, I had to subtract 0.5. Y'all just did algebra in your head. This last part says to estimate or evaluate the function when t is equal to 5. All that means, you guys, is to plug 475 times 0 0.5 to the fifth power into your calculator. Where did I get this 5 from? The question. Whatever number they ask you to evaluate, we're plugging that number in. So let's go ahead and go to your calculator. This is definitely not stuff you can do in your head. I can't even do this in my head, but the parentheses matter. So you type 475 parentheses, 0 0.5 parentheses raised to the fifth power. What did you get? 14.84, very good. So here's what this situation is telling me. It's telling me, I'm gonna pretend this is like, I don't know, what's about $475? And is an Apple Watch about that price? Is that what they are? I don't know, we're gonna pretend that you got an Apple Watch and then five years later you tried to sell it to somebody. You could only charge them about $15 for the Apple Watch because the price of technology decays as you have it, correct? Like if you ever try to sell your phone back to somebody and it's worth way less than you paid for it, that's called decay. So the price of technology decays because it's outdated technology. That's what this is kind of showing you. Can we do the other one? Okay, in this one, let's kind of walk back through the steps. We just want to know if it's growth or decay. So we look at the parentheses. Is that one going to be growth or decay? Growth. Why? Because it's bigger than one. It's bigger than one. Amazing. When that parentheses number is bigger than one, no matter how much bigger, even just slightly bigger, it is growth. What's the initial value here? 12. 12. So A is 12. And B is 1.05. But if we wanted to know the rate or the R, we want to know how much bigger than 1 it is. How much bigger than 1 is 1.05? 0 0.05, 0 .05, right? Like that's what I have to add to 1 to get 1.05. What is 0 0.05 as a percent? 5%. So my rate of growth here is 5%. Okay, if we uh, start to whatever the situation is, I can't think of one that would have these numbers off the top of my head, I'll be honest. But if this time is 5, what does that mean for us? What are we doing with the number 5 when it says t is equal to 5? Yeah, raise it to the power of 5. We're just plugging in a 5, essentially. Now, this one should get bigger because we said it should be growth. So if you don't get a number bigger than 12, something happened. What number did you get? 15.32, yeah. That's going to be our estimated value for whatever this situation is telling us. And like I said, I can't think of one that would start at 12 and only grow that much, but... This is, this is how much we'd have after we waited five years. Now, kind of like the iPhone example, there are some really important things that grow or decay that you will probably use in your life. No, you may not write an equation down for it, but you do need to understand that way you don't get conned out of your money in your future. One of those things is like example three. It says... The value of a car in thousands of dollars can be approximated by the model, or equation, y equal 25 times 0.85 to the t, where t is the number of years since the car was new. Look at the equation. Is this growth or decay? Decay. decay. Why? Because the parentheses number, the b number, is less than 1. Also, think about this in real life. If you buy a car and then try to tell it to somebody, can you sell it for more or less than you paid? Yes. Less. It's gonna be worth less, it's an older car. Okay, that makes sense to me. Uh, so we said that this is decay, great, we answered that. It says, what is the annual percent increase or decrease in the value of the car? So we want that percentage. We found the percentages or the rate when we figured out what had been added or subtracted to the parentheses number to make that number. What I mean by that is, if I have one 
minus something, it needs to be equal to 0.85. What would I have to subtract from 1 to end up with 0.85? This is where we just try some things. And, and in my brain, I'll be honest with you, when I'm doing this in my head, I make this 100 minus something equal to 85. It's 15, right? So this number would be 0.15. That's how I do it in my head is because I'm, I somehow can work easier with like 100 versus 1. I don't know. Okay. And if 0.15 is the number in the equation, what is that as a percent? What's 0.15 as a percent? 15%. That's the rate of decay or rate of decrease in the value of the car. Then it goes on to say, estimate when the value of the car will be $8,000. Now this is important because if you know you wanna do a trade-in, you don't wanna trade your car in too late and not be able to get cash back for it. So we kind of actually do this sort of thing. I know you're gonna check Kelly Blue Book for it, but this is what Kelly Blue Book does. We want the value of our car or the output of my equation to be $8,000. That's the Y value. So essentially, we are trying to solve this equation. Based on the math that you know how to do right now, we actually don't have the skills to solve for t. You eventually will get the skills to solve for t, but right now we don't have them. So we need to use our resources to do this. What we are going to do is we are going to type our equation into the calculator in y equals. Yes, I know it says a t up there. You just change it to x. And you're going to look at a table of values. And you're going to look on that table of values until you find this number, 800. Wow, that is 8,000. 8,000. It might not be perfectly on there, but I want to know when it would be about $8,000. So once we notice in our calculator that about seven years is the T value that gives me the output of 8, or 8,000, since we're measuring in thousands, we know that T is approximately equal to seven years. So if you're trying to get a good buyback on your car, you need to know about what time to sell it and get a new one. Or you just drive it till it dies. That's what I do, obviously, today. You can tell. Okay. Does that make sense? Let's see another example. So car, technology, any sort of things you purchase and try to sell back is always going to be worth less unless it's, I don't know, souped up or house, houses may increase and or decrease depending on the market. It depends. Uh, but population is another interesting thing that is kind of governed by these exponential functions. In the year 2000, the, the world population was about 6.09 billion. During the next 13 years, the world population increased by about 1.18% each year. Write an exponential growth model giving the population in billions T years after 2000. Let's do that first, then we'll do the estimate sentence. First of all, is this going to be a growth or a decay equation? Growth, it literally tells us, cool. But also we see the word increase. Increase is gonna tell me it's gonna grow. So the equation I'm filling out, I'm getting this from the front side of your paper, is gonna be y equal to a times one plus r to the t. I need to fill in a and I need to fill in r. What does a represent in these equations? If you don't remember, flip your paper over. The initial value. What was my initial population? Six point zero nine billion. We're not going to write the billion part of that. We're just going to write six point zero nine. So we have the equation y equal six point zero nine times one plus something to the t. Where do I get that rate from? The r value. Correct. Your percentage number is your R. The rate is always given to you as a percent. Even in real life, banks charge you in interest rates as percents. Car loans come in percents. Those sorts of things are always given to you as a percent. But when I plug it in my equation, I don't use the percent. So what number should I write in my equation? We, 
don't use percent. So how, what number should I actually write down in my equation? Oh, remember Dr. Pepper rule. So we have a percent. Which direction do I move the decimal? Which is this way. Feels weird. Yeah. Feels really small, but here's, here's how we're doing this. We're going to fill in the number 0 0.0118. Because again, that was moving my percent to decimal the right direction. Don't be thrown off when the percentage has a decimal. It is a percent until you move it twice that direction to the left. Okay, cool. We're going to clean this up just by one step because it's, it's got this plus sign in it, which is fine. But we like them to be nice and neat. So when we clean this up, all you have to do is add those numbers together that are in the parentheses, which is just easy. This is 1.0118 raised to the t power. That's my b value that we've been finding this whole time when it's all combined together. So it's really pretty simple to write the equation. You find the initial value, you find the rate as a, as a decimal, Plug it into whichever equation you need to plug it into, and then just clean up the parentheses. Add or subtract those numbers, and you have a calculator to do that. But this question goes on to say, or ask, to estimate the year when the population was 7 billion. Population is my output. So it's asking me, again, to solve 7 equal to 6.09 times 1.0118 raised to the t. We want to know what this t value is. We don't have the skills yet to do this by hand. So how did we do this in the car question? Put it in a calculator. I want you guys to do this one without me having to show you. I want you to find me the year estimate when the population was 7 billion. So we see that our T is equal to 12. But think about how this question was just asked. It says estimate the year when the population was 7 billion. If you say 12, you're talking about the year 12 AD. It says what year? If you say 12, you're talking about literally like 12 AD, way back when. This question is measuring, and this is always tricky about these. It says our initial year is 2000. That's the start that we started measuring. 12 means 12 years after that. So what year is it if it's 12 years after 2000? 2012. So make sure on these questions that you actually answer the right question. Yes, it's been 12 years. If it asked how many years, you say 12. But if it says what year, don't tell them 1280. Tell them the year, 2012. So on your homeworks or on tests, if you get an answer and you're like, it's 12 and 12 is not there, but 2012 is there, that should be a click for you. It's like, oh wait, that wasn't the right question. It's asking me when, not how long. Okay, cool. One other thing that's really important that's in this realm of exponential equations is interest rates. Again, something you will be exposed to in your life because you will probably at some point take out a loan, get a mortgage, buy a car, and you need a loan. Those are the sorts of things that happened. Uh, and compound interest uh, is used in some of those situations just depending on how your bank does business. For compound interest, there's a, uh, an equation we need to have memorized. The equation is the amount in your account is equal to the principal investment times 1 plus the rate divided by the number of times compounded raised to the n times t power. Oof, that's a lot of letters. So we'll go over what each of these letters mean because it's a little bit more complicated than the rest of the things. This A value represents the amount in your account, so your final. And I'm just going to say final money, because most of the time we're doing compound interest, it has to do with money. The P, just like the placement of the A, is in front of your parentheses for an exponential, which means P is your initial value. It's used, uh, the letter P is used here because it's called your principal. Principal investment. So if you ever hear that, we'll write that down. 
principal, not like principal of your school, principal L-E, not A-L. Your principal investment. Uh, the next letter we run into is R, and R is just like R was in the other problems. What did R stand for in our other problems? Rate, and make sure it's in a decimal when we plug it in. Then we have this extra number that we've, or letter we've never had before, N. N is very interesting because N stands for the number of compoundings each year. Yeah. Okay, and we're gonna spend a second talking about number of compoundings each year because this is gonna be given to you in word problems. If it says it is compounded quarterly, here's your word, quarterly. What number represents quarterly? Okay, quarter is 25 cents, yes, but we're talking about how many quarters would go into a dollar? Four. In the same way your grading periods in school now are quarters, how many quarters do we have? Four. So quarterly means four. If it says monthly, what number would you use? Four weeks. Wait, not, not weekly, monthly. How many months in 12. 12? Okay. And then if it says daily, That's 365. 365. So for these things, we have to know some... Um, financial vocabulary, it might say, I don't think any of our examples do, but something might say compounded annually. Annual is one. It might say semi-annually, that's two. It might say weekly. Uh, that's, oh my gosh, how many weeks are in a year? 52. Thank you. I just blanked so hard on how many weeks are in a year, but that's the sort of words you're looking for. Weekly, quarterly, monthly, daily, annually. Those are all financial things. And if you don't know how many they are, you can Google that word. Google will help you. The last letter here is T. What do you think T stands for? Time. That's the number of years. And it's specific that it's in years when we're doing these equations. Let me rewrite that because that's... Specific. I know this kind of went all over the place, but this equation right here is super important. I would put, you know, like maybe highlight it, put a little cloud around it so that you can find it very quickly. This is the compound interest formula. We will be using this for a while. Okay, let's practice some compound interest. We're going to be using this equation. Let's pretend you deposit $9,000 in an account that pays 1.6% with annual interest. Find the balance after three years when the interest is compounded quarterly. Okay. This number that they gave us, 9,000, what letter does it represent? I highlighted it in a hint. A. Not the A. Uh, the, P. the P. You deposit it. That is your principal investment. So we know that our P value is 9,000. That's how much you're investing. That's how much you're putting in the bank. That's your principal, your initial value. Uh, what is the number 1.46%? The rate. However, when I write it down, just to remind myself that it doesn't need to be a percent, what number should I write down? 0 .1, 0 .2. Move the decimal twice to the left. Very good. We're moving this twice. Boom, boom. Uh, one of the other letters we need is N which is the number of times it's compounded. It is four, how did you know it was four? It says quarterly. So you're looking for the place where it says how it's compounded, compounded quarterly. The last thing that we need is T, T for time. How long are we measuring this? Three years. It's gonna tell me the amount in the account afterwards, which is saying, because that's what it's asking for. Find the balance or the amount in the account after three years. Well, great. That's just stuff I got to put together and plug into an equation. So we write, 
The amount in the account is equal to the principal investment times one plus the rate, 0 0.0146, divided by the number of times compounded, four, raised to the four times how many years? Three. Ooh, that's a lot, but guess what? Those are always calculator questions. This is not something you're gonna ever do in your head. But you have to type it in exactly like this. With the fancy fraction, with the correct exponent, the whole shebang. So I'm gonna give you like 30 seconds just to make sure you can type all of this in because you're gonna need to be able to. Yes, you can do it on Desmos. I would not recommend doing it on the, like the iPhone calculator because of its complicatedness. So either use Desmos on your phone, use the calculator emulator, or use my calculator. I'll give you a second. When you type that in, you should get a dollar amount. And since it's a dollar amount, we're gonna leave two decimals because that's how we write money. So it should be, hopefully, $9,402.21. So here's how banks work, if you didn't actually know this. You deposit money into the bank, you leave it there, don't touch it. It grows. If you come back after three years after you deposit $9,000 into this bank account, you will have $400 more just from telling the bank, hey, hold this money. That's how banks work, which is kind of cool because you don't have to do anything. You just tell them, hold my stuff, and your money grows. Yes? Can I have you guys try the second one? Okay, so do the exact same thing. Find all of the letters from the equation that are in the word problem, and then I want you to go ahead and calculate the balance at the end of four years. I'll give you some time. If you're stuck, I'm just gonna start writing it up here, but I'm not gonna say anything. Did we fill it in correctly? Fabulous. So at this point, beep, 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 we're just typing it in a calculator. Hopefully that part is smooth. We should have gotten 9065.49 dollars. So again, it's really important when you do choose a bank or you choose a loan or you choose these sorts of things to look at the percentages. I just want to point this out to you for like money management skills. These were not that much of a different deposit. Yeah, $400 difference. But the set first account earned a whole lot more than the second account did in a short amount of time. Why do you think this one earned more money than this one in that short amount of time? Because they deposit more. They did deposit more, so that's part of it. But what else is different? Because this one, we waited longer on the second one. So you'd think it'd be significantly more. We didn't wait as long on the first one. What else was different? The percentage. the percentage. When you take out a loan or you look for a bank to do banking with, you wanna look at these percentage of returns. Now these are really pretty high. These are not like most banks that's significantly low. We just wanna show you like what happens. This is only 14.14% difference but it gave you a whole lot more money if you have a higher interest rate for savings. That being said, if it's a loan, you want a lower interest rate because that means they're charging you less money to let you borrow their money. 
So it's really important you pay attention to those interest rates and maybe run the numbers like this to see how much you would end up owing after a certain number of years before you take out certain loans and do things like that. Yes? If you're interested in this sort of thing, there are financial literacy classes for free online. Don't wait for someone to teach it to you if you feel like you need to learn it. Y'all are at the age of intelligence being everywhere. Your teachers do not have to teach you something for you to learn it. Go learn the things you're interested in. Or take Money Matters because we actually do have a class about this sort of stuff. <laughs> <laughs>